Welcome to the Murfreesboro City Council. It's April 1st, four, excuse me, April 4th. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Madeline Scales has our prayer and our pledge. Thank you, ma'am. May we bow our heads? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you just to say thank you, Lord. Those two words are very powerful when we look at the sacrifice that you made for the celebration that we did when this weekend when you rose up, Lord, and all the things you, you just took just so we could be here today. I just can't imagine the nails and everything you went through and the hunger and the thirst just so we could be here, Lord. And we just celebrate you and say thank you, Lord. You protected us when storms all around us, Lord, but you gave us grace. You gave us protection. And Lord, we appreciate that. And our city, Lord, we just thank you for the many blessings that you bestow on our city and we just ask that you have mercy and grace on the homeless, um, the broken homes, Lord, the children and families that are hungry, the children that are abused. Lord, it's just so much, so much going on around us. And we just ask for your mercy and your grace. We Thank you for our protection of our fire and police department that they protect us so we can rest at night, Lord, as they do their job. We just ask that you dispense angels all around them to protect them, protect our city employees and every citizen in the city of Murfreesboro. We just ask for your protection, Lord. And Lord, we ask for teachers, bless the teachers, Lord, and the poor children, things they go through today. When I was in, growing up and can't imagine going to school scared that somebody may bring a gun or children fighting teachers, Lord, it's just, you know, our, our, our world is just, it's in need of you, Lord, your protection. And Lord, as we get ready to handle the business of the city, you say when one or two are among us, you will be in the crowd, Lord, we just ask for you to come in the center of all the decisions that we make tonight, give us protection. And Lord, we just can't thank you enough. We love you and we adore you. This is my prayer that we ask in your darling son's name, amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, Liberty and <clears throat> All right, we have a uh, we have a stars award. Randolph. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council Members, as well. As you know, uh, the Stars Award was created to recognize those individuals who go above and beyond their normal job duties by providing outstanding customer service to both our internal and external uh, customers. And sometimes that means being a team player and going above your normal duties. Well, for those of you who are basketball fans out there, you can easily identify with this individual. As March Madness comes to an end, you've seen this type of player on the court. You know the person, the one who always goes the extra mile and doing things, such as diving on the floor for a ball, setting the hard screens, getting plenty of rebounds, playing strong defense on every play. And when needed, this person will always be willing to take that game-winning shot. She's what we call an all-around player. Tonight's recipient is April Pettigo. She's the assistant customer service manager in the water department. She's been with the city now for a little bit over 13 years. She started off as an accounting clerk, later transferred to the water department, and a few years ago she was promoted to the, customer service, the assistant customer service manager. She was nominated for the STARS Award by Laura Gammon. Laura is an accounting specialist in the water department. Following are the comments provided by Laura. She says the following about April. She's always willing to help everyone and does, does so with a smile on her face. She not only helps customers, but other co co-workers as well. No matter the task, April is always dependable. She's at work daily and stays over when needed. She can always be counted on. April, if you would please stand. On behalf of the mayor, the council, and the great city of Murfreesboro, we recognize you 
as a STARS Award member for the month of March. All right, let's move to, um, we have our public comment on actionable items list and we have seven people who are signed up to speak. Um, if you will, when I call your name, if you'll come to the podium and you'll have, if you'll keep all of your comments directed towards the council, I'll keep a timer. We have three minutes uh, per person. If you'll get that, direct those to the council. If there are any questions, what I'll do, I'll write down any questions that will be for um, before the item, and I assume most everyone's coming to speak on item six. So um, the first person I have is Miss Margaret Shoemake, 1925 Memorial Boulevard. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor. Yes. Um, because the policy only allows for 15 minutes of total comment, okay. if you want to allow all seven who okay. have signed up to speak there needs to be a motion to just suspend the rules can i have a motion to suspend the rules please so second. motion a second uh, all those in favor say aye. aye aye opposed all right miss brown did you get that all right all right miss shoemate welcome okay. thank you my name is margaret shoemate i moved from chattanooga where i was an educator for 35 years i now live at adams place and I've been there for four and a half years. My daughter took me all over Murfreesboro to every independent living facility that she thought I might be interested in. I wasn't impressed with any of them. They were all just alike. There's just nothing different about them. When Adam's Place finally had a vacancy, my daughter took me there and we drove through the gates I was in awe of the southern charm before me. Chattanooga has nothing like this. The beautiful buildings, the tall stately trees, the grassy areas. It was just what we were looking for. There was peace, quiet, you felt you feel safe there. And we all we all have that. At eight o'clock at night you can hear a pin drop in the hallway. Now we do have entertainment. We hop on that bus and we go to the to MTSU. We go to plays over in Smyrna. But we have people who like to stay behind and play cards or read in their apartments. There's all kinds of entertainment. We don't need a clubhouse to entertain us. We're very happy with what we have. <clears throat> we don't want to live in a construction zone for whatever time we have left. In a recent meeting with residents and NHC, I asked for residents to raise their hands if they were opposed to the expansion we were shown. Then I asked NHC, please turn around and look at these people. Over not, or at least 90% had their hands raised. A year and a half ago, we asked res residents to sign a petition. 76 people signed. One lady said, no way. They will retaliate in some way. One of the gentlemen told me, my brother said, I probably shouldn't sign anything. They were afraid of the landlords of NHC. We've had people tell us it's a done deal. The city council will never support us. They're going to support big corporations. We, we know that the NAC sees us as dollar signs. We ask you to please see us as people. The people that are, are going to be moving into those apartments if they're built are 55 and over. 
they're mobile. They're not going to sit in those apartments for 15 or 20 years waiting so they can move into Adam's place. They'll be up and gone. We are here for the whole time. We're going to be here until we're out of this world. We came to live here forever. You only have one chance to make a first impression, and this is where Adam's place is most successful. Please don't throw away the jewel. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shoemate. We agree with you. We like Murfreesboro better than Chattanooga, too. <laughs> All right, I have Mr. Mark Wood, 107 Haynes Haven Lane. I'm speaking for a small group. I was told I would get five minutes. Is that correct? Is it for the Homeowners Association? It's not for a homeowners association. It's just uh, people within the neighborhood. Sure. Well, yeah. and if you would, if you'll pull the microphone up to you so we can hear you, that'd be great. All right. My name is Mark Wood. I live at 107 Haynes Haven Lane. I stood at this podium 30 years ago. The city council gave us what was called the 1994 PUD agreement. This document had six stipulations, and the first one was five residential lots on Haynes Haven Lane. <coughs> excuse me, will remain residential. The landscaping and buffering will be on the RS-15 lots. The city council wanted a buffer between Adams Place and Haynes Haven subdivision, and the original Adams Place project was contingent on a permanent buffer remaining along Haynes Haven Lane. Jamie Averwater had a discussion with Miss Green during the planning public meeting. Jamie asked, did the city put it in writing that these five lots will not be rezoned in the future? Yes, that was the response. They have it in writing. This dis discussion was settled in 1994, so we really shouldn't even be here about rezoning these lots. I stood here 13 and a half months ago. I stood alongside several Adams Place residents. At that time, the average age of the Adams Place residents was 88 years old. <clears throat> Now their average age is 84 years old. In that short 13 and a half months, some of their residents sadly have passed away or have been moved to full-time care. They sold their homes, they moved to Adams Place for rest, for peace, for tranquility. Instead, they have spent the last days of their lives in the city council chambers asking you to protect their contract for 65 and older. What a sad commentary on Adams Place management and the way that they're treating their residents. Let's run down a different foxhole. This area is the 231 drainage basin flood zone. 30 years ago, the Walmart side of a two-lane memorial stayed flooded all the time. The state widened memorial from two lanes to five lanes. The state increased the road elevation by about seven feet. <clears throat> when Walmart built, they raised their elevation by about seven feet. They added underground wastewater cisterns, two water retention ponds, and a pipe that runs under Airport Road. Where this pipe dumps wastewater, it floods when it rains heavily. The empty lot next to Whataburger floods during heavy rains. All the 60-year-old trees that are on the Whataburger fence line are dead. Trees can't live when the groundwater table is too high. Charlotte from Adams Place spoke at the public hearing. She was concerned about the apartments that are, have been flooded. She was concerned about losing the green space. Green space absorbs rainwater and helps slow flooding. Adams Place said that they had a mandate to keep all runoff water on site. They don't have a water retention pond. They have an immediate catch and release wastewater system. The water goes under and through a chain link fence at the back of the property. They failed to keep this promise. At the public hearing, Sean Wright said there is a need for 55 and older apartments. Let's focus on that word need. There is a need to honor promises made by the city council. The promise that the city council made in writing to, uh, that lots one through five, five on Haynes Haven a promise that they wouldn't be rezoned, a promise made to prevent future construction from encroaching into the permanent buffer. If built, some of these parents living at the 55 and older community will have children, children on electric bicycles, electric skateboards, go-karts. Adams Place residents would live in fear of being mowed down. There was a, a massive amount of opposition at the city council public hearing. Some council members wanted to shoot this process down and have Adams Place start over. But Mayor Shane, you wouldn't have it. You wanted more discussion. You wanted indefinite deferral, and you got it. And now Adams Place is, is the benefit of the doubt. You gave Adams Place the benefit of the doubt. Here we are seven, 13 and a half months later discussing what should have been shut down in 1994. Mayor Shane, Ken Halliburton basically gave Adams Place two mandates at the planning meeting. One, build what's already approved and won't touch these five RS-15 lots, or convince this 
that this new 55 and older project is the right way to go, but they fail to convince their residents. Their residents are against this project. Is this Russia where outcomes are determined before elections are settled? Nobody likes the term bait and switch. It's associated with words like scam, dishonest, deceit. Many times scam artists prey on the elderly. The Adams Place residents signed up for 65 and older. Don't allow this bait and switch down to 55 and older even though it's a separate building. Mayor Shane, Adams Place is trying to take advantage of your generosity, but the optics don't look good for you. Are you going to make Adams Place residents the new babysitters for the 55 and older crowd? Mayor Shane, are you going to tell the residents of Murfreesboro, if it's in writing, it doesn't matter to me? Mayor Shane, the honor of this situation is with the Adams Place residents, the Haynes Haven subdivision, and the residents of Murfreesboro, because we have it in writing. We've got it in writing, and I gave this to you last time. Thank you for your service. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Mr. Wood. All right, Ms. Carol Clark, 327 Haynes Haven. Ms. Clark. Hey, I'm Carol Clark. I live at 327 Haynes Haven Lane. I'm here to ask you as Murfreesboro City Council members to deny the proposal for Adams Place to convert the RS-15 lots to PUDs. The Murfreesboro City Council mission statement is found on the Murfreesboro Tennessee.gov website states the following, which I'm sure you're familiar with. The city of Murfreesboro strives to provide a safe, progressive, and healthy community for its citizens by employing dedicated individuals who work together to ensure the highest possible quality of life. Your city is committed to creating a better quality of life and making Murfreesboro a great city in which to live, work, and play. As a decades-long taxpaying citizen of Murfreesboro and a taxpaying resident of the Haynes Haven subdivision. I expect that the city council who represents us to protect our homes and our neighborhood against infringement from Adams Place and the related consequences. Adams Place knew how those lots were zoned years ago and they know how they're zoned now. And so do the residents of Haynes Haven. They know we oppose rezoning those lots and have for years. Why are their interests put above all of us who reside in this neighborhood? I am not anti-business, but business plans should not negatively impact Murfreesboro residents. Once again, they knew, they knew and know how the lots are zoned. Their decision to reverse course and ask for them to be rezoned is interesting given the amount of pushback from their neighbors. Is it because we are not a million dollar home subdivision? Is it because they don't respect us? That our quality of life, safety, and home values don't really matter? Many of the proponents of the zoning change have been dismissive of our concerns. We have a right to expect that our city council will value our concerns about issues like quality of life, safety, and home values. A business should not be able to expect more from the city council than we get. So as a longtime resident of the Haynes Haven subdivision, I am asking you, as our city council members, to vote no on the rezoning request. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Uh, Mr. Ralph Fullerton. Ralph Fullerton, resident of Adams Place. Ladies and gentlemen of the council, appreciate your time. It may appear that the vacant land known as Adams Place is presently not serving a purpose. In reality, it is serving a minimum of two. One as a buffer against the ungodly traffic on that road and in the noise. And the second purpose, it appears to me, is a filter in the mitigating factors of noise and pollution generated by item one. Stephen Hughes, founder of Rugby Tennessee, stated in the 1800s, we can do little to add to the beauty of this place. However, we should take all precautions to preserve what beauty here does exist. I trust this urban oasis in question does not become another set of apartments on concrete blacktop adorned by additional vehicles. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fullerton. 
Miss Lori Duke, 423 Haynes Haven Lane. Miss Duke. Hi, I'm Lori Duke. I've been at 423 Haynes Haven Lane for 30 years. I stand before you today, once again, to express my opposition to this rezoning request. The residents of both Adams Place and Haynes Haven are united in our opposition to this rezoning effort. The only ones in favor of it are the ones who stand to profit financially. The people who live here are the ones who will be negatively affected. Also, it's crucial to remind everyone here that an agreement was originally made not to rezone these lots, specifically to preserve the green space and maintain a buffer for the residents of Adams Place and Haynes Haven. The decision respected the character of our neighborhoods and ensured a peaceful coexistence. The fact that NHC has chosen to disregard this agreement and pursue rezoning yet again demonstrates a lack of integrity and respect for our community. As a Christian, I view agreements as sacred covenants or promises that should not be entered into lightly or to be broken. It's essential that both parties uphold their agreement unless mutually agreed upon otherwise, which is clearly not the case here. The principle is especially important when dealing with development projects that can significantly impact the lives of residents. Allowing NHC to bully their way into reversing this agreement would set a dangerous precedent, undermining the trust and stability of our community. The hardworking residents of Haynes Haven, as well as the residents of Adams Place, have repeatedly rearranged their schedule to attend these meetings, demonstrating our unwavering commitment to protect our neighborhood and have our voices heard. I urge the City Council to reject this request for rezoning, put an end to this back and forth, this attempt to wear us all down. For the sake of our neighborhoods and the integrity of agreements already in place, please deny this request. NHC will find another way to make money the residents of Adams Place and Haynes Haven cannot make more green space. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Duke. Ms. Cynthia Allen, 206 Peacock Avenue. Hello. I know most of you are on there, so it's good to see you tonight. I'm sorry to be here for a uh, citizen request, but I am going to try to appeal to you guys on a couple of different issues. Um, I know our neighborhoods come up many times, but I wanted to ask how many of you are aware of the drainage issues that are there and that we've brought up repeatedly? Are you the only one, Mr. Shacklett? Is anybody else familiar with that? You're, talk, you're talking about Haynes, right, Haven? I'm talking about the whole basin, you're, but specifically Adams Place yes. and also behind um, so I was late because I was trying to print you guys some pictures and I took a bunch the other day, um, actually last night about six o'clock when I got off of work and I could only get two of them to print in time, but could I share these with you guys? Yeah, if you want to give them to Ms. Brown, that would be great. So um, I did a video too, but it was too large to try and send. Thank you. or at least I wanted to ask, there's basically six really big issues that are there. One of them, as you can see in the pictures, is I don't know that they changed the drainage from what they've showed each time, but um, we've raised the question that the drainage does not go to the detention as it's reflected in the plans. It does not go uphill to the drainage basin that is reflected. It shoots behind the neighborhood homes and goes down basically like a collapsed rocky area and it sits there and it shoots all the trash, tons of trash on a regular basis, masks, gloves, mm -hmm. bottles, cans. I've got pictures of them in there. There's a 55 gallon drum that's been back there for 20 years that we've asked about. Who knows what was in that? Um, but the only way for that to get to the drainage basin as it's reflected is to go up three hills, which you know water's not going to do unless we have a massive flood. But where it did go in one of those pictures, you'll see the back of the house that's there. It went halfway up that person's property. That person has a child currently. The people that lived there prior had a child. And if you fell into that water, it would be very difficult to get out. There's lots of leaves and um, limbs and trees and stuff like that that you can see in there. So 
it truly is an issue with the drainage. So I would ask that if you guys haven't been there to look at that, we definitely need to defer this to, to see how that's going to be fixed and repaired. Um, there's not a lot of basins. That's not a basin. Um, and it doesn't make it to the detention. The second thing is, Whataburger was city property um, when we started going through this, and that was sold. I don't know if the drainage study has been done to show and reflect that property and how that storage capacity changed. But with the new airport that's coming in, I read that you guys are supposed to have an environmental study. Is that correct in the next year? No new airport. Well, not, not the expansion, I guess. Are, are you guys supposed to do an environmental study for the airport? It was in your minutes last month. I did, well, we're doing a runway protection zone where they're re Relooking at the the both ends of the runway for runway protection, but and, and the the tower the, is federally funded and requires environmental study. Anything yeah. federally funded. Does. The reason why I asked that though specifically is because the detention on the back side of your airport is draining to the properties behind in the uptown square behind Sonic, and as you'll see on the very last page, since we've met last time somebody has posted a flash flood hazard sign back there and you can see the property damage so both sides of the basin of this drainage area on that intersection are now completely changed from the original plan and we've been asking how has that been reflected in the documents that you know show us how is this going to affect the water how's it going to solve and alleviate the problem that's happening behind adam's place how is it going to protect the property owners where it's draining on? So we've got two detention ponds that are completely draining off-site to the adjacent properties and causing a problem. The last thing that I wanted to address, sorry, I know I only had a few minutes, but was there a traffic study done on the changes and with Whataburger and how that was going to impact as well? Um, and then I go back to, to um, yes, Alan. the last thing, which was the initial rules that were in there that they said they would follow. So I'm with them. I wish you guys would hold to the original recommendations. So thank you very much. Thank you, Miss Allen. Miss Valerie Martin, 207 Peacock Avenue. I'm Valerie Martin, and I live at 207 Peacock Avenue. And first, I'll go over a few concerns that I had at our last meeting, and then I've got some comments afterwards. Do we really, really need this development? Do we need the added traffic? Do we need the extra strain on our infrastructure? Is it worth it to alienate the residents of Adams Place and Haynes Haven? Can you guarantee that the development won't create more flooding? And most of all, are the developers and city council willing to go back on our previous agreement to have the lots remain zoned RS-15, just to line the pockets of the developers at what cost. And I'm going to read from a paragraph that was sent from Mr. Clyde Roundtree to um, Mr. McKnight with the city development. And uh, apparently Adams Place has some misconstrued ideas about things. After research, we are confident that there was no commitment made in 1994 not to develop the RS-15 lots along Haynes Haven in the future. On the contrary, all property, including this Adams Place campus, is subject to a request for rezoning or a PUD amendment at any time. The decisions made 30 years ago were based upon and subject to the facts as they existed at that time. Both the facts and Murfreesboro's needs have changed, and, and so NHC has adjusted the PUD to meet these changes. To the extent there were questions about flooding, this property has not been subject to disruptive or destructive flooding. Well, on the flooding, I beg to differ, even for Adams Place. My sister-in-law was a resident there in 2020, and I visited and I smelled fresh carpet, fresh paint, and I asked her, I said, are they remodeling? And she said, no, there was flooding in some units and some of the residents had to be moved and they're having to replace some things. So even at Adams Place, they've had issues with flooding. 
and we sure do in the subdivision. I mean, it's just like a lake in my backyard sometimes. <clears throat> and as far as the agreement, uh, my neighbor, Mr. Wood, has presented you guys with the uh, minutes of the meeting in 1994, and there was an agreement, contrary to what he said. I have to wonder if Adams Place is acting in good faith for instance, they haven't suggested any changes that might accommodate us more, and, and they're not thinking about uh, expanding within the campus that they have property to expand on. And they canceled their appearance at the last meeting about an hour before the meeting started, which I find in very poor faith and at best unprofessional. So I hope that the council takes all of this into consideration when they vote on the decision to rezone and vote against it. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for letting me speak, yes, and um, I appreciate your service. Thank you, Ms. Martin. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll move now into the consent agenda. Uh, you have five items on your consent agenda. Move for approval. Second. Motion is second. Ms. Brown, please call the roll. Ms. Averwater? Aye. Ms. Gales Harris? Aye. Mr. Maxwell? Aye. Vice Mayor Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Wade? Aye. Mr. Wright? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. We'll move to old business. Uh, you have land use matters, ordinance 20, item 6, 22OZ48, rezoning property along Memorial Boulevard in Haynes. Mr. Barbie? Good evening, Mayor McFarland, members of the Murfreesboro City Council. Uh, the next application for consideration before you tonight is a request uh, submitted by Huddleston Steel Engineering on behalf of National Healthcare Corporation. Uh, the request is to rezone a portion of property along Haynes Haven Lane you see in the green on your screen now from RS-15 to PUD, Planned Unit District. Also included with the application is a request to rezone the existing PUD to accommodate, um, let's see, it would be able to accommodate 53 additional multifamily units. Uh, this would consist of eight buildings or 11 buildings in total. Three three story apartment style buildings that would be located along Memorial Boulevard and eight two story structures that would be located along Haynes Haven Lane. Uh, this is the same application that City Council reviewed in, on January 19th of 2023, and no changes have been made to the application or material since that date. At the January 2023 meeting, the public hearing was held. It was also well attended as this one is tonight. After the public hearing, Council voted to defer action. Um, the current application uh, has been received, and they're requesting to move forward again with this, this same request. Uh, the applicants have notified me that they conducted a meeting with the Adams Place residents on March 18th of this year uh, to provide them with the information that they're coming back to council for the rezoning request. No additional neighborhood meetings were conducted as a public hearing had already been held uh, for this exact same application previously and nothing had been changed since that date. Um, we have representatives with both the applicant and the developer here tonight uh, with Huddleston Steel Engineering, we have Mr. Clyde Roundtree and with NHC, Mr. Mike Ussery is here tonight as well. Um, and at this point, I'll hand the podium over to Mr. Ussery. I believe uh, both gentlemen have a presentation for you tonight. Mr. Ussery. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the council. Appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. Uh, my name is Mike Ussery. I uh, live at 2508 Belfast Court. Uh, I am the president and chief operating officer for NHC. I've worked for NHC for over 43 years, most of which have been uh, here in Murfreesboro. Uh, just quickly to give you an overview of what we'd like to do tonight, I'm gonna cover a little bit about uh, NHC, but more so Adams Place and how we've got to where we are with this project. Uh, Terry Deal, who's our executive director at the Independent Living at Adams Place, will talk a little bit about her operation and 
the services that we offer now and, and how this will complement those. Clyde Roundtree, as was mentioned, we'll, we'll talk a little bit overview of the project, uh, answer, I think, deal with some of the questions about green space, flooding, and so forth. And then Josh McCreary, our general counsel, is also with us to, to help answer questions should they come up that, that are more in his areas of expertise. Before I get into the NHC and Adams Place story, I thought maybe, maybe it'll be helpful uh, to try to respond to some of the things that have been brought up in the comment period. Uh, so I'd like to try to, uh, to, to take a stab at that uh, first. In terms of, of uh, NHC, uh, it's been said in, in previous council meeting, our company is, is now 50, almost 53 years old. It started in Murfreesboro by Dr. Carl Adams, a surgeon. And Dr. Adams' vision at that time was to start as a nursing home company. That's indeed what we were. We started with 16 nursing homes. But his vision was much more than that, it was to become a senior care company. In fact, we're the first private company to offer home health care in the state of Tennessee. I mean, it has nothing to do with nursing homes, but just example of, of what his vision was. It was to be able to impact the care and services available to seniors. So he really started that vision uh, and, and developed a range of services. Continuing care retirement communities was one of those. He had a vision in Murfreesboro to provide a continuing care campus, which obviously has become Adams Place. That was his vision, a range of services all on one campus. Right now on that campus, we have skilled nursing and rehab short-term nursing home care as well as rehab care, a lot of times post-acute care for people who have been hospitalized for fractures or strokes or, or similar short-term arrangements, but also continuing care. We have assisted living and memory care. And then we have independent living, which is primarily what we're talking about tonight. Independent living as we offer it there is in a congregate style. It's, it's almost like thinking of it in terms of a, uh, a dormitory style where we have internal hallways, very, very nice apartments, don't get me wrong, nothing like the dormitory I was in, but all the services are under one roof, if you will. That was the state of the art when we built Adams Place. That was what a independent living offering looked like. But as uh, Adams Place was developed, as we've talked about, 1994 agreements was developed 30 years ago. Senior care is just like every other business and profession. It's, in, it's evolved. It continues to evolve. But certainly over that 30-year period, it's evolved. It's what was state-of-the-art then uh, is not state-of-the-art anymore. It's not what is what is, if we were building Adams Place today, we'd build what we're proposing here. So what's driven that evolution? A lot of things, several things, you hear about them every day, the growth of the 80 plus population. Uh, the 80 plus population has grown 56% in Tennessee between 2020 and 2030. At the same time, caregivers are less available. So having services on one campus is going to be necessary going forward to meet the needs of Murfreesboro. The other thing that I think I have to try to paint a little bit of a picture for is having all these different ranges of services on one campus really meets the needs of families going forward. Again, there's gonna be all those services on one campus Additionally, uh, there, there is the opportunity that if I and my wife move into independent living, she may need health care, more likely I may need health care before she does. But we have all these offerings on one campus. There's been discussion about independent living. Our independent, independent living model is a monthly rental, independent living as would be the new suggested offering that you're going to hear a little bit more about tonight. What we currently have on the uh, Adams Place is a 55 and older 
project. It is available for 55 and older individuals right now. That's no different. Our average age now, I think the gentleman said 84, it's, it's in the low 80s is our average age right now. We don't anticipate that we're going to be, we'd be, we are available to 55 and older. We have to be available to 55 and older, and I think Josh and Clyde can speak to that. But we would anticipate the majority of the people moving into this project are probably going to be in their 70s. We just think that's the much more likely. Try to move forward here quickly. Questions have been raised about the RS-15 lots and the approval from 1994. Just to give a little background on that, we came in 1994, and I wasn't specifically part of that, but NHC came and had presented a, a PUD for that entire property, including the RS-15 lots. During the zoning meeting, there was discussion about removing the RS-15 lots from the PUD, which was agreed to by NHC and the city. There was, to our knowledge, no agreement that there would always be residential or that the request to rezone or amend the PUD would never be made. Also, in fact, I have to point out that the current RS-15 zoning would allow five homes with driveways on Haynes Haven. That's the current zoning that's in place. We think the plan that we're presenting is much more thoughtful and, and respectful of the residents, both our residents and the Haynes Haven residents. Any expansion of Adams Place offering whether we consider tonight's proposal or the 1994 proposal is going to encroach on the green space. We are currently under the current PUD, not including the RS-15 lots, we're currently approved to build 90 more units on that property. That's what's already approved. We're proposing to reduce that to 53 units, all inclusive of the RS-15 lots. Uh, Clyde is going to speak a little bit to the green space and not what we believe is losing green space, but is reconfiguring it and making it more accessible. The proposed project that we're talking about won't create any more traffic than what's already approved in the 94 plan. Again, 90 units are already approved versus the 53, 53 we're proposing. Our project, we don't believe, is going to add traffic to the adjacent roadways in any material way, uh, particularly when you consider that Walmart, Whataburger, and nearly every other commercial development on Memorial has occurred since 1994. When we were before the council last year, I think we failed to explain a lot of these things. And, and I think, uh, I want to take just another minute to explain some of, of the evolution of how we got the specific project that we have. Before we brought the plan that you see tonight to the, uh, and, and before we brought that to the Planning Commission, we had already presented a plan to the neighbors and the residents that included a different orientation and a different look, both in the buildings along Haynes Haven and in the buildings internal to the property. We modified those buildings as proposed in this submittal to look like single family residences with residents, uh, excuse me, with residential landscaping. We made those modifications prior to when we were here last year. And we based that on what we were hearing from the residents and the neighbors. We also modified the look in the internal buildings to make them less modern looking based on input, again, that we had received. Then after the meeting last year, after the deferral, uh, and, and, and the, I think, suggestion in, or strong recommendation that we go back and reconsider things, we did that. I will tell you that we challenged Clyde and Keaton 
our, our architects and engineers to go back to the drawing board. They did that. And they presented some alternatives to us. We invested considerable time and, and effort in that. But at the end of the day, and driven by really the input of Buckley Winfrey, Buckley is the person that runs that campus. He runs out of the place. And specifically Terry Deal, who runs the independent living, based on their recommendations, they believe the plan we had already put forward was the best. They're the people that are on the property every day dealing with our current residents, excuse me, and our potential residents. And they believe the plan we put forward is, is the best offering that we've, that we've been able to put together. I said earlier, I think the, the, the best way I can put it is if we were developing Adams Place as a blank slate today, it would include what we're proposing tonight. In fact, I would tell you that there are a number of people who have come into Adams Place that would have elected one of these options had it been available. So I'm going to turn it over. Uh, Clyde's going to talk to you a little bit more about the detail in just a moment. I just want to end my comments by saying a couple of things. First of all, NHC, I believe, has been a good corporate citizen of Murfreesboro for now 53 years. We want to be here 50 or more. The Adams family still lives here. The majority of our senior management lives here. I mean, this is an important project to us. We're not just doing it in a haphazard fashion. We firmly believe that this is the best project for Murfreesboro or the current and future residents of Adams Place. So thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to Terry Deal. Good evening, Mayor McFarland and members of the City Council. My name is Terry Deal. I'm the Executive Director of Adams Place Independent Living. I'm here tonight to discuss my operations and the services that we currently provide and the services that we want to provide. Some of my residents would lead you to believe that all of my residents, or at least the majority, are opposed to this project. This is simply not true, not any longer. I have been with Adams Place for just over five years. Uh, in that time, historically, any time we have a survey or a petition, one half to two thirds of my residents will respond to those surveys or petitions. Uh, that indicates that there's another one third to one half that are just not involved enough, either negatively or positively, to take part in the process. In addition, some of those who do respond actually respond positively, showing support for whatever it is that's being surveyed. In May of 2022, when we first introduced this idea uh, to my residents, uh, several of the residents got together and generated a petition against the expansion. There were actually 68 names on uh, that, that sign, rather than, I, I think Mickey said it was 76 or 77, it was actually 68. Uh, I had 100 residents at that time. Our focus over these last two years has been on those 68 that signed. But I ask, what about the 32, the 32 that didn't want to be involved? In March of 2023, I generated a survey uh, asking, in addition to some other things, asking what is your position regarding this expansion? 58 of my then 100 residents responded to the survey of those 58, 52% indicated they were either in support of or neutral to a decision for expanding. 58 of my then 100 residents were passionate enough to respond, but again, we have 42 that didn't. And on March 18th this year, we held a meeting uh, with the Adams Place residents. We wanted to make sure that they were aware that we were back on the agenda uh, to ask for a vote in favor of our rezoning request. Um, we ha did have a sign-in sheet for that particular meeting. 67 of my current 105 residents, or 64%, attended the meeting. The reason why I'm giving you these numbers is I want you to see the percentages of the people 
yes there is a percentage that is speaking against but there is an equal percentage that is either supportive or they are remaining neutral I propose in each of the scenarios that the ones who are not showing up are just not interested in voicing either support or neutrality Unfortunately, in today's world, it is very rare to find a Riley Gaines type personality who wants to stand publicly in opposition to negative views. This is the case with my residents and even a few Haynes Haven neighbors that have reached out to me in recent weeks. These people just simply do not want to get caught in the middle. Several residents have submitted emails to you, uh, to you all over the last few weeks that were stating support for this project, and I feel their voices need to be heard. Uh, they copied me on those emails in most instances. One resident says, I strongly support passage of the expansion proposal. It is the right thing to do. It will meet the needs of an underserved population of seniors. It will enhance the living experience of present and future Adams Place residents. It will have a positive impact on the value of residents' investments. Another resident writes, after hearing the plans from NHC concerning additions to the campus, I first thought of all the building process interruptions to live, the, live here. However, as I started thinking about all the wonderful pluses, I became happy about what I envisioned. The additional plantings, the walkways that will facilitate enjoyment of the whole campus, and a clubhouse where lots of good things can happen and some new faces with whom to interact are exciting prospects. Uh, there's one other one that I would like to share with you. It's a little bit longer. I would like to share with the City Council my support of the Adams Place expansion project. While the history of Adams Place is important to the quality of life I enjoy, I do not think it is the resident's role to impede growth and change. The administration of Adams Place has listened patiently to the concerns of residents and made adaptations and accommodations to address as many issues as possible. We have been given ample opportunity on numerous occasions to voice our concerns, and we have. Many simply don't like the answer and continue to strongly and loudly voice their displeasure. At age 91, I certainly know that change is inevitable. We need to be supportive of change and realize the art of life lies in constant readjustments to our surroundings. Even those who are privileged to call Adam's Place home are subject to change. What was once true cannot always remain the same. I am appreciative that Adams Place has been collaborative and transparent with residents and includes us in the process. I look forward to welcoming our new neighbors to our campus one day. I apologize, there is one other one that I would like to say. Um, I'm, I'm writing to support Adams Place expansion project. I had just moved, moved in when the public meeting was held. Over the past year, I have had time to think about the proposed plan. I have come to the conclusion that the council should approve the proposed plan. I believe that Dr. Adams had the foresight to see the future for Murfreesboro and developed a plan that took into consideration the growth of Murfreesboro and the changing population dynamics. To date, Dr. Adams' vision has been on the mark and NHC has done a very good job in making Adams Place a leader in senior living in Murfreesboro. I believe that NHC, working with a committee of residents, can, build, can develop and build an expansion of Adams Place that will continue to support Adams Place as a leader in providing services to the senior community. If we sit and listen only to the voices of those that are in opposition to this or any project, we will be, able to, we will be unable to see all that is going to be gained by our residents, both current and future. The new clubhouse providing additional programming, uh, things that residents are asking for today, line dancing, Tai Chi, um, social gathering spaces, these types of things. Not all of my residents want these things, but a number of them do. Uh, by enhancing our outdoor living spaces, we're going to improve the walkways. We're going to provide outdoor grilling space. Again, some current residents don't want it, others do. Outdoor gaming areas, a secure dog park. Uh, we are dog friendly. Even a putting green for our, our golfers that are among us. When the NHC development team came to me with this idea, they asked me two questions. First, they asked, is this a viable plan? Secondly, they asked, will you run it? And I emphatically said yes to both of those questions. Uh, I am the one 
uh, as the director of independent living. I am the one that meets with the potential residents, the, the ones that come and sit in my office and tell me the things that it is that they are looking for, uh, the reasons why they want congregate living like we currently have, or the reasons why they want another option. So by hearing the stories, by having the, the interest list, both a wait list of 37 people for my independent living and an interest list of 30 for this expansion project, um, that tells me that there is a call for a different product that we do not currently have. Dr. Adams' vision was to provide a place for seniors to be able to age in place on a single campus. Um, for 27 years, we have fulfilled that vision with excellence. I have every confidence that if you all will partner with us and my partner, uh, my residents will partner with us, we will be able to step into the future providing excellence, continuing to provide excellence in every single thing that we do. We're just going to do it a little bit differently. So tonight, I just simply ask that my residents uh, 105 of them, that they will continue to trust me, continue to trust Adams Place, continue to trust NHC, the same way that they always have since they first stepped onto our campus, and uh, that they will trust that we are putting together a project that is good not only for them, but for future generations. There were a couple of comments that were made, um, one in particular that I want to want to address because Everybody, uh, you know, we have talked about 55 and 65 and average age of 83 and all of these types of things. And the comment was made that we would have 55-year-old residents who will have children on go-karts and motorized scooters mowing down our residents. Um, first of all, children are not and will not be allowed to live on our campus unless they are adult children. And what I mean by that, uh, as an example, currently I have a father and son who are living with us. The father is in his 90s, the son is in his 70s. That type of parental child relationship may exist not only with my current offering but with what we're asking for. We're not going to be having toddlers and teenagers uh, doing anything more than visiting our campus, which is what they do currently. They come to visit their grandparents and they enjoy the amenities that we have. So to expect children to be running amok on the property is just simply not going to happen. Um, Mrs. Martins mentioned a 2020 flooding that required remodeling of apartments that were damaged from water. I have been with Adams Place since December of 2018, and I apologize, but I am unaware of any flooding. There was paint and carpet and construction going on because we did take advantage of COVID and we remodeled our library. Uh, so, but Adams Place, we remodel something every year anyway to keep current. So those I just wanted to address in particular. Um, would be happy to answer any questions later in the proceeding. I appreciate y'all's time. Hello, my name is Clyde Roundtree. Mayor McFarland, city council members, thank you so much for hearing our presentation tonight on Adams Place. I'm trying to find the site plan because I want to walk you through that really quickly. Appreciate your time. As far as a designer, um, there's opportunities we have in this town where you get really excited about and there's some that you kind of work through and you're, you're happy to be a part of them, but this was one that I was really excited about. Um, Adams Place does have a standard that as a designer, you're excited about being part of because you know that they're going to do what it takes to make it a quality development. That was never a question. So we were tasked, both Keaton and I, were tasked with making it a wonderful space that we would not lose quality. The first thing we did was walk through the property and looked at the mature trees and said, what trees can we keep? You know, how can we make this work? And then we also went around Memorial Boulevard and looked at those berms and said, how can we make sure those berms stay intact? 
So we were commissioned from the get-go that the quality would not fall off at all from a design standpoint. So I just want to reiterate this. This, is, this has been a lot, of, a lot of effort to not only do a good project, but to really work towards preserving the character of Adam's Place, not just the architectural character, but the experiential character, the, the level of expectation that residents would have as they move in. Most of these folks that would be coming to these apartments and the townhomes are people who know Adam's Place reputation and they have expectations as well. So we are, we are committed, we've been committed since the inception of the project that we're not gonna step backwards. And we actually were stepping forward that's exciting too. We believe that I know it's been tough. We've been through the, the community meetings with the neighbors. We've walked through it. And I've asked them over and over to trust me that, that my intention is to make their life better. It may not sound like it from what you hear, but there's not one stitch of bone in my body that says that this project cannot enhance their quality of life. And I don't want to get aggressive or you know, on the defensive, but that's my mission as a landscape architect, as a designer, if I'm designing something, I want to make sure it's safe, but I want to make sure it's enjoyable. I want to make sure it brings beauty to their world. And I, I can't wait, because I believe in four or five years if this project is approved, they're going to have experiences on that campus they've never had before as a result of what we've done. And I think those experiences will be positive. So with that in mind, I just want to walk through this, the, the site plan real quickly. I know we're pretty familiar with this project, but I kind of want to walk through the age in place concept Along Haineshaven Lane, the townhomes that we're proposing are really residential character homes. Very, very typical what you find in another townhome development. They'd have garages, they'd have bedrooms, they'd have an extra bedroom, and they'd have um, kitchens. I mean, they would be a fully furnished residential unit. That's a certain client that has expressed interest in being at Adams Place. We only have eight of them because that's the majority. That's the that's the proportion of the property that we feel like can accommodate the need of the client that that's making that request. Most likely, if our vision is fulfilled, they would move from the townhome units into the into the active living, more apartment style living. Now those still have bedrooms. They still have a smaller kitchen. The lower units have a garage. But they don't have two car garages, they don't have extra bedrooms, they're really designed that this is when someone's life is beginning to change and they need less space. They still need less care than what would happen um, inside the facility currently, but yet they can still stay on the campus. And then as it moves on, they would probably move from the red buildings into the current structure as it stands. So we feel like we're trying to proportion the properties to allow that experience to happen. The aging in place concept is what motivated every design decision we made to make sure all those needs could be accommodated on the campus. That's why you see the ratios and the percentages of apartments are percentages of buildings that we've chosen. It sounds like a lot. There's 11 new buildings on campus. All that has really been designed and sized to meet the need. Now what Ms. Terry didn't say to you is that there's a waiting list for all these units. People are in line to get into these units. She is basically educating them on the process as well as the residents that are coming in now that are living in the current um, care situation. As they move into Adam's place, she's educating them on the potential of the future. Then in the future, there may be some construction. We want you to know that. As you sign on contractually, we want you to know that there may be some disruptions, but we're gonna do our best to manage those. So the expectations from the design team have always been towards making sure the quality of life doesn't change at Adam's Place, making sure that those come in, get to experience the Adam's Place experience, and that we're aging in place, that, that that concept is clear to define and design. With that in mind, what I'm super excited about, if you all know the campus now, Adam's Place is a beautiful, stately campus. I've walked it, I've enjoyed it. The only issue I have with Adams Place is that their primary living spaces outdoor wise are on the south side of the building and they're passive. There are two, there's a large pastoral area on the uh, south, uh, southeastern corner of the property where the active living units are gonna go potentially. Right now that is a lawn area. They use it once a year. It's used for some functions. It's, it's people walk their dogs out there and I've learned from the, from the residents that yes, it's a lawn area that's not utilized, but they see it. It's, it's beautiful to look at and it represents a pastoral feeling. And we understand that, that it's helped me as a designer to hear them because I'm understanding that that really matters. What they see 
matters, what they feel matters. So we, we're committed, and what I'm so excited about is rather than that green space being something they look at, as a landscape architect, I'm gonna get them something that they can enjoy and experience. And that's my commitment. If I am so committed to that. So I just say, I don't wanna be over dramatic, but I just wanna tell you that it's never been lost on us that these green spaces will become active lifestyle green spaces. Right now, they have a pool area that's enclosed. They have a beautiful courtyard that's inside the center of the building. My issue with those, they're all shady. They're not exposed to the sun. When they're on those courtyards, they're very much Let's sit on a bench, you know, let's kind of have a passive activity. We're going to open up the side of the campus where the sun lives, where I think it'll have a vitality that they haven't experienced yet on that campus because there's so much of the campus that is basically shaded by the existing structure. When we open up that south side, we've kept it open. If you notice, all the townhome units are on the perimeter. The, all the, the new active living apartment units are on the perimeter. We're trying to keep the campus very open in the middle the way it feels. But the amenity center is purely designed, and I've told Ms. Terry about this too, if we go forward, I can't wait to be a part of a, a, a team within the Addison residence who will help us better define exactly what should be in the amenity center, exactly the activities they'd like us to program, because I think it's gonna be really exciting whenever this comes online, because they will be doing things they have never had the opportunity to do on the current campus. Yes, there's plenty of activities to do on the current campus, but this is really more of an indoor outdoor type of activity that I don't think they're used to having. So I'm, I'm thrilled with the opportunity of presenting this. As was mentioned, there's gonna be covered areas, outdoor porch areas, pergolas. There'll be an interconnected walkway. There'll be a lawn area that's used for activities that they can use, you know, lawn ball. They can do outdoor activities with exercise. They can bring easels out on the lawn. But I'm just waiting for the day when they just see that sun. Just, I mean, you know how it is. When the sun's on your face and you're out there doing something fun, it's pretty nice. So as Terry mentioned, there's a dog park as well. They don't have that currently. The sidewalk system right now is not, is not connected. We're, we're going to make a commitment to make sure that the sidewalk system is connected so when they go out and exercise, it can all be linked together. They can stay on the campus and walk. We want to make sure that the area around the amenity center is actually fenced in. Something they really don't get to do right now is at night. This will be a really nice place in the evening where they can go for a nice walk in the evening be in a secured environment, sit on benches, connect with friends, but yet they can do it on their campus. That's currently not available to them. And this shows, this, this diagram basically shows the walkway system and how it'll interconnect. And again, we're committed to all these principles to make sure that the active lifestyle is accommodated, but they would find opportunities within the current community to take advantage of the spaces. As far as architecturally, I think Mr. Ushery mentioned that that we've, we were always inspired by the current campus. Uh, Keaton can speak more towards this end, but there is never a detail that wasn't thought through. Does it have some precedent on the current campus? Is it something that's reflecting the current campus? We were challenged to make it have a little bit more of a, a different look because it's a different client, but we were never, we were never told to, to deviate far from the way the current campus feels. So with that in mind, we are committed, we've been committed since the day we walked on that, that land from a design standpoint to present Adams Place to the standard it currently has, to expand the opportunities for more people to enjoy Adams Place, who would take a little bit of a demographic difference from the current residents, and for them to have the ability to say Adams Place is our home at, the, at a younger age and stay in place. We know there are people who are looking for this opportunity. We know it's a need in Murfreesboro. So with that in mind, that, that's been our commitment. Uh, we're excited about the possibility, but you gotta trust us that if we have the opportunity to move forward, we're gonna do all within our power to make sure every resident that's currently there has a sense of connection to the new spaces and the new places. And I've even challenged them that maybe even these new residents could be people that could really bring value to their lives. So with that in mind, uh, Josh, do you have anything you wanna add based on? Okay, um, Keaton, do you have anything to add? So with that in mind, if you have any questions for anyone who spoke, we're, we're available to you. Thank you for hearing our concerns and hearing, um, letting us present to you. And uh, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, Miss Deal.
you had said that you had, uh, I guess, 100 residents. You had 58 that responded. Yes, sir. And you said 52 of them were positive? 52% of the 58 okay. responded either positively as in support of or neutral. So positively or neutral? Yes, sir. But you don't know about the other 48? They did not respond to the survey, no, sir. Okay. You don't have copies of that or at least an example copy of it, do you? I apologize. I've been at management conference all week and have not been in the office. I, I neglected to bring it. Okay. For, I guess, uh, Mr. Ussery or Clyde. So the existing phase four was for 90 units. Those would all be like one single, one person living in them? That's not necessarily the case right now. It, it'd be the same type units we have right now. So we have units now where there may be a husband and wife that share a unit. We have, I think, 105 residents, Terry? I'm sorry, 105 residents in 89 apartments to give you an idea. Okay. For the 53 units, are those all one bedroom or two bedroom or does that same math work out? Could you have 106 people living in 53 units? You could, just like we could have whatever two times 89 is, but yes, we, we could have, I mean, you could have that many. Okay. Mr. Maxwell, may I say something regarding that? Sure. So currently of, uh, we have 17% that are double occupancy, either spouses or in one case, as I mentioned earlier, a father and son. So if we take the, um, if we take 90 units and assume that we're going to apply the same 70 to 20 percent, 17 to 20 percent, that is double occupancy. If we go with 90 units, then we would be looking at 108 residents. By going down to only 53 units, if we apply that same standard of 17 to 20 percent, then we would be at 64 residents. Okay. okay. Adam, okay. are you good to say something about the RS-15 lots? If you could ask me the specific question, yeah, I am prepared. It, in 1994, were the RS-15 lots supposed to stay RS-15 lots forever, or were they just omitted from the 1994 PUD? It's the latter. They were, they were omitted. Um, they remain well. That they remain. It says that what it says in the minutes is that they the five resident lots remain residential. And that, that's a condition of the PUD. Yes. And that PUD is, was created by legislative action, that an ordinance of the city council. But there is nothing that says they stay RS-15 forever. It's what it says in the minutes is that, and I was just pulling up the ordinance here. Um, in the minutes, it says the, that the, the, quote, five residential lots remain residential, period. Does it indicate in the minutes the reason for those, that zoning, the RS-15, it, it, is it mentioned as a buffer? Is it mentioned as a buffer? Probably in the minutes, and I, I've just pulled up the ordinance itself, um, and it says- Mr. McKnight? Yes, it, it, it was not, um, well, Mayor Council, it wasn't stated that it would be a buffer. Those lots, the, there were five lots, uh, part of that 1994 amendment. Uh, it stated that lot five or lot four would have parking on it, um, but it was not utilized as a buffer. It talked about a buffer pin behind uh, those um, lots. Well, not what? to correct you, but I'm looking at the document and it says the landscaping and buffering shown on the, I mean, it's the word is used as buffering. Yeah. So I mean, my, my question goes to where it, it's an initial t intent was to establish that as a buffer to the neighborhood, and and that was the intent. And I just wanted to get some explanation as what has changed. 
I mean, if we're going to rezone this, or then is there some reason for it that n not needing to have a buffer anymore? Yeah, I think it's just part of their amendment, uh, okay. uh, Councilman Shacklett. Their amend their request to amend the PUD has that amenity in it or that request in it. Okay. So, so the nineteen ninety four document. It doesn't say never. Uh, it just says we want. It was a part of the conditional approval for the 1994 PUD amendment. I guess, in my opinion, when we said we won't do that, I'm taking it like not going to do it. But then we come years later and change it. it I guess six in one hand, half a dozen in the other, how people interpret that to me, but uh, I'm not talking, you can, yes, yes sir, I was just talking. Um, when we let the residents speak the other week, every, well not every one of them, but I know at least 90% of them got up and said that uh, the percentage was like 87% uh, something of people that did not want this project. And then uh, tonight I'm hearing that, and I think they were talking about, maybe I'm, com I'm getting a little confused. Everybody didn't take the survey, but of the ones that took it, that, that's where you got your numbers from. That is correct. So one of them, I think you said 57 out of how many residents? So in May of 22, 68 out of 100 residents signed a petition. In March of 2023, regarding a survey that I initiated, 58 of 100 responded. And of that 58, 52% were either supportive or neutral. And I think one of the things that is happening, and I, again, I apologize for not having these documents with me tonight. Um, but. I am happy to show to my residents, to you, to anyone, the actual sheets with signatures. Right. Uh, you know, so it's easy if if we had everybody in this room stand up, I could look around or, you know, said everybody except the back row stand up looking around, I could say, well, 85% of the people stood up in the room. Well, I don't really know if that's an accurate 85% or not. And, and not to say anything against my residents, I love my residents dearly and I I think they all know that, but it's it's easy if you don't have pen on paper with names. It's easy to not know right. the accuracy of the numbers. So that was why when I came to you tonight, I wanted to make sure that I was giving you actual percentages right. of people who had signed or come to meetings. And to me, and this is just my interpretation, that 57 percent percent out of some of those are neutral. Those, to me, neutral people could be no. Neutral people could be no. Yes, ma'am, I agree. We can't put the neutral with the yeses. That's what I'm saying. That's possible. Um, so of that, we had, of the neutrals, there were, there were 19 supportive, 11 neutral. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so yes, the neutrals, you're right, could go either direction. Right. Okay, uh, and this is not necessary for you. I'm just going to ask some more questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what about the drainage? Madeline, can I ask a question? Sure. Before you leave, just, yeah. just one question, because I think we had this brought up uh, uh, about your waiting list. Yes, sir. Uh, that you, you said there's two waiting lists. And one of them there's, there's a waiting list for my current independent an living. List. And, an and then there's an interest list for the people for that the are new, interested new in the new project. proposal. Yes, And sir. there were like 37 on the waiting list? Is 37 that? on the wait list, 30 on the interest list. Okay. And totally different people. So uh, at your present capacity, mm -hmm. uh, 37 people are interested on a waiting list right now. How mm -hmm. long? Uh, you know, I mean, the issue was why, why did we not just grow what, with what we have to meet the 37 needs? Is it, I mean, and, and I, I certainly appreciate that. So the interesting thing about my wait list uh, is because of the reputation that Adams Place has, uh -huh. um, 
especially anybody who is from Murfreesboro, they know that they want to get on the wait list long before they need it mm -hmm. so that when they do need it, their name has made it pretty close to the top. Okay. So in a number of instances, I may have, a, so I've got five different room styles, technically six, but one, two of them are almost identical. Um, so let's just say for my one bedroom, my, my small one bedroom, I have, I think, currently 14 people on that wait list. Well, when I have an apartment to come available, I'm going to start calling through that wait list, and the first eight people might say, I'm not ready to come yet. Okay. So we move on to the next one. So if I were to build 37 apartments today, I would not fill them. I got you. Okay. That makes sense. All Sounds right. like a daycare. I mean, you know how... <laughs> I mean, no, I'm not being funny. No, I'm just no, no, saying. I know what you mean. You know, I put my, child, my son on the waiting list for a daycare, and, I mean, for uh, some kind of class, but he wasn't eligible for it, but mm -hmm. it was such a popular class. You know, exactly. I just wanted to get his name on the thing. I, I can understand that. Yeah. And even because Murfreesboro is growing as rapidly as we are, um, adult children move into the area. They become familiar with Adam's Place. They come get mom or dad on the wait list because they may be living in California or in right. New York or wherever. Right. And they know that in three or four years, mom or dad is going to follow the family down here. So they just go ahead and get them on the wait list so that they'll, again, so that I'll have a place when they're ready. I wonder, what was the thinking when you, you all said, I can see the age of uh, 55, I can see that low in the age. Because 55 is the new whatever. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what was you thinking about the children? Now, like a couple of months, I'll be 71. Mm -hmm. I have a seven-year-old granddaughter mm -hmm. who I want to come down here in the summer and stay with me at least two weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the thinking, no children? So it's not that there will be no children. So even currently in the existing independent living, if a family member, no matter the age, wants to come and stay with the parent or the grandparent, they may do so for up to two weeks, um, it, staying in the apartment. We also have guest rooms that are available. So if, if they're coming maybe for a shorter stay, then they can stay in that guest room. So the, the thought behind no children is that children are not going to be moving in permanently with their parents or their grandparents. Yes, they're going to come visit. Um, we just a week and a half ago had one of our residents who had two grandchildren that spent the weekend with her. I think the kids were probably eight and nine, something like that. Um, they fit in very <laughs> well in the community. They were very respectful. They were out in the halls unsupervised, which was perfectly fine. Um, so, you know, even in this expansion, I firmly believe that children and grandchildren will come to visit for short periods of time, but not to be there long term. And when they come short term, even if it's one of the teenagers, they're not going to bring their outdoor toys, their their scooters and their, their bikes and stuff. I've got residents that ride their bikes. Yeah. Um, so yes, they, there will be family members that come and, and stay for short periods of time, but not living as residents. There will be guidelines like there is currently. I just know in today's time, it's uh, quite, you'd be surprised, quite a few of grandparents actually keeping their children. I mean, are raising their children. And that will become an operations issue of I mean, I, how I address I was just you know, curious. them. Uh, my, my thing, another thing is uh, traffic. Mm -hmm. If we're building that many more units, with that, sometimes it'll be two cars. So and then you do the math on that. The traffic flow has to, to me, is terrible now, especially if you trying to get into, let's say, uh, Chick-fil-A. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, first of all, you could kill yourself tra crossing over right now. And then, you know, I, I don't see how, and it's already a school zone, so traffic is already, especially on uh, James, is it? Haynes, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And to add that many more units, I, I'm concerned. I don't need an answer on that. Okay. Um, I, I'm concerned about that also. Mm -hmm. um, what was my last question? Drainage. When they had, yeah, did they okay. answer the drainage problem? 
Mr. We, Huddleston. Sam. Sam. Thank you, Ms. Steele. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council. Um, probably a little background on the area um, in the 90s when um, Adams Place and some of the other um, uh, properties along Memorial Boulevard, including our airport, uh, started to develop our, our engineering and planning team at that time certainly recognized some limitations to the drainage there. The city partnered with uh, the property owners there and we uh, conducted a study that internally we refer to the 231 North drainage basin study and we identified um, uh, properties along the east side of Memorial Boulevard that would be the airport side as well as the west side of Memorial Boulevard uh, that were in a sensitive drainage area. Um, on the east side of Memorial Boulevard around the airport, the city uh, uh, in, uh, conducted a drainage improvement project and so we created a storage basin there, um, established uh, flood protection elevations for, that, for those properties. On the west side, we did the study but then required future development to participate in the improvements as they develop. So we did not construct wholesale improvements there. And so that study is still a guideline for us in that, in that basin. And what I would also say to you that our community, um, we reserve places uh, for extreme events. For example, along our streams and rivers, we identify what we refer to as a 100-year floodplain. The expectation being that in extreme events, that area is going to contain water. Uh, and perhaps at times contain um, high, high levels of water. Uh, we've, we've done the same thing in our neighborhoods. We don't call them 100-year flood zones, but their stormwater management areas, our stormwater management systems, drainage ponds, detention ponds, retention ponds, ditches and pipes, and we expect those areas to, quite honestly, contain water in extreme events. Some people refer to that as flooding, but it's anticipated flooding, it's predicted flooding, and it's purposeful drain, it's purposeful flooding. And so to see the airport and the basins around the airport when we have extreme events full of water, that's exactly what we expect. What we don't want to happen in there is for that water to get into finished spaces, uh, carpet and drywall, I think the comment was made earlier, uh, or to block roadways. Um, and so. We're purposeful in that design and making sure that we have a desig designated place to store and or manage those, those waters in extreme events. And I, I believe there's a plan in place uh, that provides that overall um, uh, study for that drainage basin. The obligation then becomes on the developers as, as projects develop in those areas to make sure that we follow that plan. Our staff reviews that and the developer uh, and their design team also participate in that. And, and nobody um, on city staff or on the developer's team uh, want to hear the answer from a future resident that, hey, my, wa my building is wet. I have waters in my garage or in my living space because of your project. And so we're, we're very careful and very deliberate about that. Um, I, I, I certainly got confidence in our team that, um, that as this project moves, moves forward, Bet between the 231 basin study and our current stormwater regulations, um, they'll be able to, to come up with a, a plan to manage um, a, 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 an amount of additional uh, stormwater from this project. Let me ask a question about traffic because, I mean, the issue that it's not going to affect traffic or a, a little bit of traffic or something. Have you looked at this? Because I think that we, at one time when you presented this, it was we're going to. There's people that have cut through your property to get to the to the light, the stoplight there, it, and that's not. They're not going to be able to do that anymore. Is that is that what we're? Is that, is that still part of the project? That so they won't get, be able to get to a light to be able to turn. Is that? I mean, I I, I don't remember exactly where where we got at that point in time. That that access through the property to the light is not going to be there. I can speak to that briefly and, and maybe a couple of other things if you'll give me permission. Okay, sure. sure. Um, as to the, the gate, um, what's been happening is people are cutting through that. Right. They're using that gate. Yeah. And I think that what we presented last time and we remain uh, in this position is that we'll do what 
you want us to do. So if, if we need to make the gate functional and let people come through there, we can do that. We can also uh, make it where they cannot, and we'll, we'll go whichever direction the city council would prefer with respect to that. I, I'm just concerned that it's gonna, there's gonna be more traffic and that, that there's a whole lot of, it's hard to get out on that street. I've been over there a couple of times just to kind of see how things were going and it, yeah. you don't want to turn certain directions at certain times of the day, you just never get out. No, I understand, and I suspect now the, the residents of Haines Haven who are here, I doubt they want that gate locked, <laughs> but, you know, yeah. oh, well. it, it is what it is in that respect, and so we're trying to be accommodating right. uh, and would continue to be if we can. If I, can I, can I does that answer your question? I may yeah, just that's fine. two that's other fine. quick things. Um, real quickly, um, on the age restriction piece, let me just restate, and I think Terry probably said this a minute ago, but I, I want to say it again. This is not a change. This would not represent a change in the way we handle age restrictions. The, the uh, proposal at 55 and older is a targeted age restriction. It's, it's, a, it's a, a methodology that's um, based on HUD regulations, and it is exactly what we're doing right now. It's not different. We're not lowering it. It's, we, we're literally applying the same age restrictions that we use in our IL and our AL now in this new concept. So just to be clear, that again has gotten a little gray here and there that, it, that we're, not, we're not changing anything. It's the, uh, it's the same thing. And I wanted to just briefly address the uh, RS-15 lots as well if I could. And, and let me say, first of all, I agree with Mr. Tucker and Mr. McKnight in terms of what happened in 1994, and let me offer just um, maybe a perspective or some context in my mind on what happened there. When you go back and read the entire minutes, it's important to kind of back, take one step backwards, I think, and say what was happening that got to where they, where they arrived. And you have to remember that when NHC was coming to the council in 1994, they were presenting the entirety of the property, including what we're now referring to as the RS-15 lots, to be part of the PUD. So when they showed the drawing to the council in 1994, there were things drawn on the RS-15 lots. They came to the council and there's this discussion in the minutes about all a myriad of things. It's several pages long if you read through those minutes. And as that meeting got to conclusion, what was agreed upon was to take those lots out of the PUD so that the PUD got approved, the RS-15 lots got pulled out. Now, in that context, you can see why when you get to the ordinance, number one, when they get to the list of things that you were referring to earlier, says five residential lots along and fronting Haynes Haven Lane. It wasn't a restriction, it was a statement of reality. It was a statement of what had occurred at the meeting because they had come in expecting those lots to be part of the PUD. As a result of the meeting, they were not. They were five residential lots along Haynes Haven Lane, and so the resolution stated that reality. When you read that, uh, the, the actual statement there, there is nothing in that resolution in any shape, form, or fashion that says that they would forever remain residential, that they could not be subject to a rezoning, that they couldn't be requested to be put into the PUD later. It doesn't say any of that. And there was no restriction against the property put down. There was no written agreement with the city. There's, there's none of that that reflects some kind of um, unlimited and perpetual limitation on NHC's RS-15 lots. In fact, there's really evidence even in that writing that that's not what was intended because when you read the rest of the statements in there, you see, for example, that the city council allowed them to put a road right through lot three, which is right where the gate is you were talking about earlier, completely inconsistent with the concept that they would be residential only forever. They're not. There's a, there's a road going right through them. And there's also a statement in here um, in item five, I believe, that specifically mentions that if NHC develops the phase four that was approved at the time, that there would be parking on lot four. So completely contrary to the concept that these lots would remain buffers, 
or residential in perpetuity, the actual resolution in 1994 contemplated something very different, that they would have, they would be zoned residential, but they would be used for other purposes then and in the future. And so um, respectfully, we believe that there's no restriction that would prevent us from making this request. As you all know, zoning requests are just that. I mean, that's, that's the whole nature of the game. Zoning changes. People ask for requests to change PUDs. They ask for, for uh, zoning to change uh, here and there. So uh, we would respectfully submit to you that uh, at least as to that issue, that we meet all the other conditions that are required to rezone and amend this PUD. You all know, having done this a long time, rezonings always are going to raise people's emotions. That's the nature of it. People are, people are interested in property and, and we're interested in our residents. But at the same time, when you get to this point in the process, it's really not a popularity contest. It's a question of whether or not the applicant has met the zoning requirements. And we believe we have. So uh, respectfully request that you um, grant our application. Happy to answer any other questions. Mr. Roundtree, can I ask you a couple questions? We have questions for Josh, too. Oh. Yeah, I still have a question for Senator. It's fine. Go ahead. All right. Go ahead. Sean, Mr. Roundtree. Yeah. Uh, I, I've got to just see if you could refresh my memory from Planning Commission. It's been a long time back since this has been in front of Planning Commission. Uh, of traffic and buffering, uh, the, the buffer from the first plan to this revised plan the buffer stayed the same, correct? There may have been like a couple of trees changed from the, the first plan that was presented to us to this plan, is that right? I think our expectation is to, at a minimum, maintain the current buffer as much as possible. We're gonna be encroaching on, with our grading a little bit on that, but we wanna go back and reinstate, um, we wanna go back and replan. And I think we're more than willing to do whatever it takes to make sure that satisfies the neighbor's expectations as far as the density of the plant material. Yeah. We, um, we want it to be solid because it, it's gonna protect, you know, the residents on the, on the active living units. As far as the residential component, the townhomes that are a little bit further down Haynes Haven Lane, that's where we made the biggest shift. Those were oriented, those were oriented in towards campus and you're, the backs of the buildings were gonna be facing Haynes Haven. Mm -hmm. We switched that. We made those to be the front so that they would have the residential character. Again, they're different than the homes because they're a different time period. Mm -hmm. But we try to be sensitive scale-wise. We scaled the buildings down. We changed them their character. Mm -hmm. That was purely in response to make sure we were being sensitive to the neighbors. Mm -hmm. But at that point, that's more of a residential style landscaping. We're not trying to screen out what's behind it. We're trying to make it look consistent with what you see further down the street. Okay. And then traffic wise, I think the discussion at Planning Commission was for all the Adams Place residents to use the stoplight to enter and exit and to leave the gate open for Haynes Haven residents to drive through to access the, the stoplight, I think was the discussion at Planning Commission. Is that correct? I thought we said close the gate. I don't recall. I, I, we did talk internally that um, we would definitely encourage and coach the new the new residents to try to go to the stoplight. We know that there are situations where they're going to go towards the west on Haynes Haven and go back into the neighborhood. It, it's it's like like Josh said. It's one of those things where you know whether we keep it open or closed. It's it's a benefit to the neighbors for sure. Um, it's one of those things that we we're going to need leadership in the future. It's a benefit to close it to the neighbors. No, open it. Oh. No, not to the neighbors, but to the residents. When you said neighbors, you're pointing. Yeah, is it a benefit to close it? I, I think there's there's pros and cons, uh, Mayor, on both sides. Okay. I think there's a lot of benefits are closing it just because I think it's probably safer. But at the same time, I think it's one of those things where it's it's such a benefit to the neighborhood that that's why it's open. Right. <laughs> because it provides access through to that light. I thought it was open because it was broken supposed to be gated and access if you look at the original ordinance yeah supposed I, I, yeah i guess i'm remembering planning commission differently i thought we said we were going to close the <laughs> it's been two years i don't know <laughs> it has been two years we have all slept since then so yes when we originally came 
to the planning commission the gate had been left open for a period of time because it was broken we did get that fixed um, to where it was operating pressure sensitive um, and we said at that time that again we would defer to whatever the city planners wanted us to do whether it would be uh, secure it to where only Adams Place could make use of it or leave it open to where the Haynes Haven neighbors could also use it uh, I giggled when you said that it was propped open because it is propped open again right now because a resident actually hit it the other day and broke the arm so we had to order a new arm for it so it is currently open okay so Jamie do you have some other questions uh, who is my next victim uh, <laughs> no it was it was Josh and or Clyde the buffer the buffer if it's changed I guess I apologize because when I when we saw this a few weeks ago I thought the buffer was substantially the same and or improved from when it was at Planning Commission is that correct or am I hearing that the there's an issue with the buffer now no it's been improved it has been improved yeah okay yeah that's what I was verifying it. okay good let me ask a, a question this is not an easy one to ask but I want to ask it anyway uh, no. okay. and you you can say you don't want to answer it this is over a year since we saw this and a lot of times when I see developments come in and they're contentious like this people make concessions to be to draw to get to agreement you know to, to get to a consensus that we can move forward together and I think you understand how much I think of this company it has been a a jewel in our communities and 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 your heart for the community needs to be acclaimed and honored and dr adams and all the boys and went to school with them and all so i i i don't want to let that fall on ears of why i'm interpreting this and wanting this answered what was your expectations for waiting over a year and presenting the same project I know you're gonna say we all agreed that it was a good project in an initial did you did you ever consider there's something that we need to do to I, I think even some conversations I had with some of y'all I said give me something give me something I can hang my hat on to say why I would change a boat because I was concerned as I expressed in the last time we heard this and I and I thought show me something give me something and and we come back with the same program and it and I just you know I'm not trying to put you on the spot Mike you know I've known each other a long time we played ball kids have played ball and all so I know you very well but I, I just wonder why didn't we why didn't we do something why didn't we just change something yes sir and my first inclination is to say I just assume not answer but uh, <laughs> with all due respect I, I will try to respond to that I mean we did truly did go back I mean it's been longer than candidly I apologize it's been longer than we wish it had been yeah. since we'd been back yeah. now we did go through I, I can tell you we went through a, a, a significant review we looked at changes from Keaton and, and Clyde both in terms of what about this and candidly I, I'll, I'll tell you something I haven't even told them but I was I was okay with the changes they had made. I don't know that it would have gotten any different response from our residents or the Haynes Haven residents. I was okay with the changes they made. I was out of town and Terry and Buckley met with Steve Flat and they said, the plan you already have is the right one. And so we did go through a considerable process to look at it. In terms of giving, you know, I think one of the things we've given is we, we're trying, again we've got a PUD right now that approved that we could do 90 units plus five RS 15 lots uh, we don't think that's in the best interest of Adams Place or any of our neighbors our residents or our neighbors why is that I'm sorry why is that I'm sorry why is why is that why is what when you say you've got a plan for 90 units mm -hmm. It's, it's 90 units just like what we have. It's in the dormitory style. It doesn't offer the enhanced lifestyle that what we're proposing does. It wasn't something that was, I can't say nowhere in the country did we have it in 1994, but it wasn't something that was on our radar. It wasn't a, a, a lifestyle type 
arrangement that offered more of the privacy, more of the independence that what we ha than what we have right now. What we have right now is, is it's a beautiful project. We're, we're incredibly proud of it, and, and we're appreciative of the residents we have. What we, though, believe is this is going to provide a, a, an extension. It's going to provide opportunities for more independent people. And, and we believe that's a good thing. Number one, I can see the situation where a husband and wife move in there, that the age in place concept is that, again, as I used the example before, if I need assisted living, I've got it right there on the same campus, but my wife doesn't have to drive, if she would, you know, 15 minutes to see me. She walks across the campus to see me. That's the beauty of the age in place concept. The 90 units that we would are approved right now under the PUD would be the same thing we have, which, again, a very beautiful offering, but it's, it's, it's dependent more on the services that are under that roof. There's a dining room and a kitchen that provides meals to those residents, whereas these people in these offerings we think will be much more independent, preparing their own meals, and, and uh, those are the reasons that we stuck with this plan. And Ms. Shacklett, I'm not sure that really gave you much well, answer. Well, yeah, no, that's fine. I, but, but the two, the two build, are you talking about the two buildings that had that were in a different location on the property? Is that is that where the 90 units that you're talking right. about that were approved? Two buildings of 45, 45 each. I believe it's. Right. it's yeah, right. that's what I'm looking at here. Okay. Yes, sir. And I think, Mr. Shacklett, so. That's where I was the first time this came to Planning Commission, but then when I really looked at the architecture and, and got a chance to walk the property, I felt like this was much more fitting with the neighborhood than building, you know, just two big apartment looking structures. Uh, so that, you know, I saw this probably three or four times at Planning Commission and then three or four times here at Council, so it's been two years of studying this project and I don't think anyone ever wants development on their street or across the street and I appreciate the passion of all the neighbors more than you know and I know a lot of you but I will say you know Adams Place is a good neighbor and they are providing a need I know they're a for-profit company I mean we all have to pay our bills but they're providing a need of our community. And I heard multiple people say that they were on waiting lists or that they had a hard time finding a facility and they finally got into Adam's place. And as someone who has aging family members, I, I would be so grateful if they could get into somewhere like Adam's place. And so I, I, I have struggled with this for two years, but I'm going to make a motion that we approve it. That is my motion. Do we have a second? Second. Motion to second. I've got a quick discussion real quick. Um, Mr. Ashford, thank you. You're, you're welcome to, you know, I read through the minutes from 1994. I appreciate, Mr. Wood, the comments you had, um, but Every PUD that we have that comes through this city at some, I don't say every PUD, but the number of PUDs that come through that end up making changes is in the high percentile because someone may have a project that they think is really good and then either the market changes or something changes that they want to adjust. I mean, the amount of PUDs that we adjusted from, the, from 2009 to 2013 was just about every single project. And so, you know, saying that a project that was proposed in 1994, 30 years ago, was always going to remain exactly the way it is, there's not any PUDs in this city that were approved 30 years ago that have not been developed that are staying the same. And the, the other part, and again, I appreciate the comments. Many of y'all don't know, I'm over at y'all's facility quite routinely. I was just there maybe a month ago or a month and a half ago for a chili cook-off. And I brought my 11-year-old. We had a great time. We sat and ate all the chili. And 
I, the part I get frustrated is when I hear things like the developer, you know, they're in it for the profit. And you can say that about some developers that are in this community or that come into this community. You cannot say that about NHC. And when I go into Adam's place, not one time have I ever been in there where I felt like it was all about the money. You know, it's about, I've been over there numerous times where they're having celebrations for people who are turning 100 years old. And that's just not what I get the feel of that organization. Now, there are some who come into this community who I voted against the Walmart that's across the street. I thought that that was gonna end up being an issue and um, it is what it is, but that's not what you can say about this organization. And so I know going from 90 units to, to 53 units, we talk about traffic, there's 37 less units that are gonna be on this facility. So that's less traffic than what's gonna be there. So I, I just have trouble finding, I mean, the numerous meetings that I've been in to beg people to come in and, and build 55 and up targeted, uh, we get, hey, we'll build targeted audience, a targeted project. Right. We don't get anyone who will come in and say they will stipulate that will only be 55 and up. And, you know, I say this to the residents in Haynes Haven, I'm in y'all's community more than you know. You know, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, we didn't allow speed bumps until I met with a lady at, at, who's on y'all's curve at behind Northfield who the car ran through there and now there are speed humps around that curve because we changed our ordinance because we saw where things could improve. I mean, I don't wanna go to an emergency room into an ER the same way it was 30 years ago. Things change. And so I think this is for the better. And the other part with this I can't get around is that if someone wanted to go and build five residential lots, houses on Haynes Haven with the driveways coming onto Haynes Haven, that would be a disaster being at that intersection. And, and I'm not saying that you guys wanna do that, but the positives with this far outweigh the negatives. The one thing that I would like to ask, and I think this is for the residents at Haynes Haven, is to please try to keep the gate open so that they can go to the light there at Airport Way. Um, so I, I'm gonna be in support of this. I could have sit here and not said a word and voted for it, but that's why I'm voting, it for, voting for it. Bill. Well, let me, uh, it's interesting that we're gonna talk about the same kind of thing. Uh, this is a difficult decision for me because I have friends on both sides of this. I have teachers on both sides of this. Uh, I have friends uh, for a lifetime served on boards with and uh, known your family and you've known mine on that side as well. So I, I was thinking about this over the last few days and what is your job? We're, you know, we're elected to make these difficult decisions when there's you know, you've got to split the baby <laughs> and decide what you think is right. And I determined this, is that I don't, I'm not here to represent and to vote what the, you want, and I'm not, vote, I'm not here to vote for what you want. What I think you elect us up here to do is to use our brains and our hearts and our experience in the community and determine what we think is in the best interest of the citizens of this community. And that is a hard decision sometimes when it becomes close like this, when there's, a, if you, on this side you consider this point and you consider this side on this. So, right or wrong, I've decided not to support this project. But it, I want you to know it is not because I haven't thought about it, I haven't prayed about it, I haven't considered all the aspects of this. And it's certainly not because I don't care about our community. Uh, and really the only thing you care about is whether we vote for it or against it. But I want you to understand there is, this is not, we're not doing this flippantly and the people making the decision are doing it because they feel like that is their decision to be made. And, and sometimes those decisions are hard because they involve friends and they involve uh, people in the community that you care about and that you know that care about this community. The blessed thing about Murfreesboro is whatever how this turns out, I hope you'll realize 
that tomorrow, once the will of the council is determined, we all want it to be successful. There's the only way forward. That's the only way forward for our community. You vote your conscience, we determine the will of council, and we go forward. And this is still going to be a special place when we wake up tomorrow. Adam's place is going to be what it has been and has served you so well. And our community is going to be well served by all of the, those people in our community. How many years? I just look at your faces and so many of you have poured into this community so much. You've given your hearts and your soul to this community. And you need to be recognized and appreciated. And I hope that you felt heard regardless of how this turned out, turns out. Ms. Brown, we have a motion and a second. If you'll please call the roll. I'll oh. say one, yep. one more thing. Okay. Uh, I'm like Bill, I've really struggled with this. It's, uh, it's not an easy decision. Um, Adams Place and NHC has been great partners and done a lot of good in this community and I appreciate that. And they've taken great care of a lot of us, taken great care of my mother um i've gotten a lot of emails i've gotten a lot of calls and most of them have been in, not in support of it um i personally wish you were sticking with the 90 units i think we need as many options as we can for seniors for assisted living uh, for long-term care it's not easy to find those um but i go back to the original you know, 1994, we can, I guess we can debate all day between attorneys and, and men. I'm not an attorney. You know, what, what was said and what was implied. And it did say the five residential lots remain residential. And that was with the first and the second reading. Um, so it's, it's a tough decision. Um, Y'all have been great partners, but I've heard more no's from the citizens in Haynes Haven and the residents at Adams Place. And that's why I'm, I'm gonna be a no on this. Ms. Brown, please call the roll. Ms. Averwater? Aye. Ms. Gills-Harris? No. Mr. Maxwell? No. Vice Mayor Shacklett? No. Mr. Wade? Aye. Mr. Wright? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. All right, we'll move to new business, item seven, sewer allocation variance, River Rock Boulevard. Mr. Barbie. Yeah, hey, let's take a five minute recess and let the council chambers clear. So, seven or 8.03, we'll start back.
Yeah, I'm, I mean, that's why I'm really asking for two times. That's a no for me, dog. All right, we're going to move to um, item seven. We have a sewer allocation variance at oh, River Rock Boulevard. But before that, uh, I want to recognize Drew Lickman who is here, uh, he's an MTSU student with the Jones College of Business. Drew is here for uh, a class, to get credit for a class, and man, you sat wow. through the whole, I mean, so, <laughs> so. First in history. Yeah. Who's your, who's you your were, professor? Professor Rosalind. Oh, he's so great. Yeah, so Drew, you're on the record, you're on the screen, so. <laughs> That's adorable. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Drew, you're, you're dismissed, man. You're good to go. Hey, good luck, bud. Thanks for staying so late. That's pretty good. Can I get a picture of me All right. on the screen? Here, Brad, let me take a picture of you. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That's the most I've ever seen Brad smile. Did you see that? Let's move to the sewer allocation variance for River Rock Boulevard. This is for commercial development. Brad. Uh, good to see you again, Mayor, members of the council. This is a sewer allocation ordinance before you tonight for 601 to 609 River Rock Boulevard. Uh, you saw this application, uh, I believe it was in August 2023, where they uh, requested one additional single family unit at that time, and it was granted. Since that time, they've refined their unit mix um, and have a restaurant that will, hopes to be a tenant at this location. In order to make that happen, they will uh, need and are requesting one additional single family unit of sewer capacity. Our Murfreesboro Water Resources Department has reviewed the request and confirmed that the capacity is available in the area, and the Murfreesboro um, Planning Department is also in support of the request. Here, if you have any questions. Any questions? So moved. Second. Motion to second, Ms. Brown, please call the roll. Ms. Saverwater? Aye. Ms. Gales Harris? Aye. Mr. Maxwell? Aye. Vice Mayor Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Wade? Aye. Mr. Wright? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. All right, we'll move to resolution 24R06. This is the application and creation of a sports authority. Mr. Tindall. Uh, Mayor, <coughs> uh, state statute allows uh, cities to create a sports authority, <coughs> excuse me, uh, for, to assist with the development and maintenance of, yeah, uh, maintenance of the, uh, <laughs> you guys wouldn't share earlier, uh, of, uh, of the uh, of sports facilities in the city. The, the authority benefits um, in uh, uh, managing certain revenues uh, that will allow for um, uh, rehabilitation of facilities, also in financing uh, new development of the sports facilities. The first step in creating uh, the authority is for the council to accept an application, uh, which is before you tonight with, uh, with the resolution. Um, after that, then a, a board will be appointed by council and the board will begin operations uh, in accordance with the policies adopted by council. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer, if, if I can. <laughs> do, you feel like that, do you feel like the formation of this will allow us to be able, you know, this is not like we're gonna take this facility and we're gonna build a NFL stadium, but does this give us the ability to be able to monetize some of our existing uh, structures to save taxpayer dollars? Exactly, exactly. We, have, we have several facilities and uh, the sports store will be able to uh, raise additional revenues that will supplement parks and recreation bu budget. Um, we've done a little bit of study to see how sponsorships might help in, uh, in a couple of our facilities, and it's a substantial number that uh, we'll be able to offset what we allocate for uh, rev or expenses. Okay. So, so we could get a pickleball complex. Oh, here we go. We, 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 if we wanted to build one, uh, but there are private industries that we've been talking to a different couple of different ones to get a pickleball uh, <coughs> complex in. They seem to, uh, the private market seems to be able to satisfy that need. Yeah. Although those will be clubs. So I think, yeah, we could um, certainly use the sports story to help finance if we wanted to do further development. We are doing some pickleball courts, some newer pickleball courts. Um, at What's Adams. The difference what the Parks and Rec Commission do and the Sports Authority, it, what, what, are, what are going to be their areas? Of the, the Sports Authority won't do anything that the Parks and Recreation yeah. Commission presently does. Okay. Uh, sports Authority would really be focused on uh, uh, when, when it's appropriate to assist in, in managing financing for uh, a sports facility development. For example, the uh, baseball 
complex that we're talking about on, on 96 to assist along those lines and then to manage potential revenues that would come in to help offset some of the cost. Okay. <clears throat> I think you're, you know, back when, when we were going through the discussion, Nate, I think it was six years ago with five or six years ago with TSSA when we went up and, and presented in December to be able to get TSS a here with a Siegel soccer facility, that would have been a, the opportunity that the sports authority could have been involved in, in you know, something like that. Right, exactly. So this is the voting on the, us submitting the application, right? Say the application's approved, will it come back to us before we actually create it? Um, the application will be the first step and then it will come back with, for appointment of board members um, and then there's a charter you notice that it, that's on there that the board will adopt. Um, so this is, yeah, this is the first step and then the appointment of boards is the next step. Along with, we'll develop policies that will go along with what the sports authority will do and the council will, will vote on those as well. Okay. Thanks for all your work on this, Craig. This is a great way to offset cost in Parks and Rec and, and take our Parks and Rec department to a whole other level. So it's, this is a great thing, and I will move for approval saying that. Second. Motion and second. Ms. Brown, please call the roll. Ms. Averwater? Aye. Ms. Gales Harris? Aye. Mr. Maxwell? Aye. Vice Mayor Shackler? Aye. Mr. Wade? Aye. Mr. Wright? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. All right, we'll look at amending the Town Creek Task Order 11. Yay. Good, e Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. Uh, this is a uh, uh, Task Order 11 was approved by the City Council last month, March 7th, and that was a task order to abate uh, some asbestos abatement on buildings 111 and 121 Northwest Broad. Um, since that that task order has been uh, was uh, passed last month, there was additional materials that were found. Uh, we're asking to amend the contract and the uh, amount what, what was previously approved at $39,150 to a revised amount of $48,900. That's a change of $9,750. Uh, quite frankly, this probably would have been an administrative approval, but it is ARPA dollars that are involved in this project, so that's why I wanted to bring it to council just to make sure that uh, everything is uh, satisfying the ARPA requirements. So. I would ask that uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me, but uh, we'd ask that you approve that, that amendment to the contract, task order, excuse me. Which buildings are they, 121 and? 121 and 111, that's the budget breaks building and the copy mat building. Okay. They're near they southeast. They knocked down the copy mat, I think, already. That's correct, yes, sir. Yeah, that was completed probably today. Today. They were cleaning up the last of that today. Yes, sir. So okay. Second. Motion second, please call the ray. roll. Ms. Averwater? Aye. Ms. Gales Harris? Aye. Mr. Maxwell? Aye. Vice Mayor Shackler? Aye. Mr. Wade? Aye. Mr. Wright? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. Thank you. All right. Brotherford Boulevard Adaptive Signal Control Technology Project Amendment Number Two. And this is a TDOT, uh, TDOT contract. Thank you, Mayor and members of the Council. <clears throat> this amendment adds $1,861,972 in additional funding. The total funding for the project is $6,217,032, of which $5,930,905 in federal funds and $286,127 local funds. The city's portion of, this constru of the construction phase will be funded by FY21 and 22 bond, as well as infrastructure general fund money. I'm available for any questions. Adoptive signal just on Rutherford for right yes, now. Mm -hmm. Any chance maybe memorial someday or? We're we're working on a separate project there that we might be <clears throat> maybe using uh, similar type technology, okay. but not adaptive. Oh. Move for approval. Second. Motion to second. Please call the roll. Ms. Saberwater. Aye. Ms. Gales Harris. Aye. Mr. Maxwell. Aye. Vice Mayor Shackler. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mr. Wright. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. Number eleven has been removed. Number 12, 2023-2024, Sanitary Sewer Rehabilitation Change Order Number 1, Mr. Gore. Mayor, Council Members, thank you for the opportunity to, to present this before you tonight. This is Change Order Number 1 to our uh, Sanitary Sewer Rehab Project in the amount of $87,023. This is comprised of warranty work involving sewer infrastructure that was installed by private uh, developers throughout the city. Uh, they have, so they have, uh, 
uh, paid us back for these funds. So this is really just incorporating that warranty work into the sewer rehab project at a zero dollar cost to us. Final contract amount is uh, seven million and twenty nine thousand dollars and some change. So we would request your approval for this change order. Any questions? So moved. Second. Motion second. Ms. Averwater? Aye. Ms. Skelts Harris? Aye. Mr. Maxwell? Aye. Vice Mayor Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Wade? Aye. Mr. Wright? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. Thank um, you. Thank you, Mr. Gore. All right, you have two reappointments to the Cable TV Commission. Jimmy Rich Richardson, who is filling, he represents Murfreesboro City Schools, and Tommy Campbell, uh, both of these would expire uh, April, or will expire April 30th, 2024. So moved. Second. Motion to second. Please call the roll. Ms. Averwater? Aye. Ms. Skelts Harris? Aye. Mr. Maxwell? Aye. Vice Mayor Shackley? Aye. Mr. Wade? Aye. Mr. Wright? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. Looks like we have a couple of beer permits. We do. We have a regular permit for an ownership name change for a restaurant located at 417 North Thompson Lane and an ownership name and permit type change for a restaurant and brewery located at 210 Stones River Mall Boulevard. Both applicants have met requirements for a permit and requ are recommended for approval pending final building, building and codes inspections. Any questions? Move for approval. Second. Motion second. Please call the roll. Ms. Averwater? Aye. Ms. Scales Harris? Aye. Mr. Maxwell? Aye. Vice Mayor Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Wade? Aye. Mr. Wright? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. And I'm not paid by this organization, but I, I do think it is uh, beneficial to welcome Tailgate to our community and taking over Coconut Bay that's sat vacant for quite some time. So um, yeah. welcome them to Murfreesboro yes. and investing in our, in our community. Uh, any statements to be paid? No, sir. Any other business from staff? We will meet uh, on the 11th at workshop in the, um, at 11.30. I will not be present. We know. Should be well, I think there's another one too, right? Someone else isn't? No, that was Thursday. No. It's Wednesday I'll be there. I wasn't going to be there for Thursday. It's Thursday. It is, it Thursday. is Thursday. I mean Thursday night. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Craig, do you mind, would the council be okay if we move that to like 11.45? The Oakland's one and two grand opening is at 11 o'clock, um, or we we could. We if, don't get started sometimes, so 11:45. Okay. I think that Let's, wouldn't be an issue. Yeah, I mean we can keep it at 11:30 with a start date, start time 11:45. That I hate not to be there for that since they're they're hey, doing Mayor, the grand. Mayor, I thought that was the 18th. I've got it for the 11th, but yeah, I have I have the Oakland's open house and kickoff on the 18th as well. Like I said, let's keep the time <laughs> as it uh, as it's stated on the 18th. It's the 18th. What, what is it? Uh, it's the Oakland's the the new Murfreesboro Housing Authority. Oh, yeah, yeah they're, they're open. Yeah, the grand opening. Did you say that? So Nate. Hey, one quick thing, Mayor uh, Sam wanted me to remind you. Tomorrow we start food truck uh, Friday lunch on the plaza. 11 to 1, uh, it's going to be April and May, then we'll pick back up in September and October. So that starts tomorrow. It's going to be a little chilly tomorrow, but there'll be a lot of people out. So we'll have live music uh, in a couple weeks, and it'll be fun. See you there. Good job. Awesome. All right. I got yeah. All right, I've got uh, two topics on the same issue. Uh, I'm sure everybody up here uh, has gotten a ton of phone calls and emails about this. I saw the mayor has responded on Facebook. I've responded on Facebook and emails and phone calls. Uh, the State Farm building on the corner of 231 and DeJarnet is not going to be housing for illegal aliens. And uh, Craig has talked to the, the ownership group and a management group and totally debunked that rumor. So uh, that's not going to happen. And item two with that same thing is that a lot of these people that have called have got a lot of fear about looking around the country and looking at what these individuals are doing to communities all around the country. In my opinion, Murfreesboro is going to, me, I'm one of seven. I think Murfreesboro is going to follow the law. If these people start acting riffraff and breaking laws, let's arrest them and move them on out of here. I, I, Craig talked to the group. I talked to the group. They, and a lot of us don't, didn't even know this, that State Farm, they have five full-time employees that are still maintaining that facility every single week. And one of the employees 
message me on Facebook to let me know, hey, I, I'm here every single day and I promise that we're not housing anyone there. And the other part with that as well, um, we've, we have zoning ordinances in place mm -hmm. and that facility is not zoned for multifamily and it's not zoned for housing. Um, so anyway, that, that is welcome to the world of social media. Um, Craig, do you have someone you want to introduce? Do I? Uh, uh, we, well, before I do that. Yeah. Austin. Yeah, I've, I've got one. Oh, sorry, Austin. I'll just add to what Sean said. Uh, I think Director Duke had commented they had 400 to 500 new uh, students this year that are illegal but their hands are tied. They have to educate those students. If you go to the county schools, they're eight, 900, 1,000. So if you do the math, that's literally 1,500 students that the taxpayers are on the hook for. So when people say, you know, it's not a problem, it is a problem. When you got, start getting that many into your schools uh, who don't speak the language, are, are behind, they affect your test scores, and then eventually you've got to find a place to educate them. You know, their hands are tied, so it's a serious issue. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, we've had a lot of, I mean, for all of us here, we've we've gotten a lot of messages and emails as this is starting to come across. But, you know, Chief Bowen, we've talked about this. We, and I say this, I'm not trying to point fingers to anyone, but, you know, the the we will routinely, not routinely, but occasionally get a letter from Department of Homeland Security that will very vague information that says, you know, um, we're, we've got groups that are coming to the Rutherford County area, Davidson County area, Williamson County area, but that, that's not any information that, you know, we're being fully transparent. We're, we're not getting any other information besides very general uh, items. Sam, you have, I wanted you to introduce Mr. Mr. Noon. Thank you, Mayor, members, Council. Uh, glad to introduce you to Ben Newman tonight. He joined us in February as our planning uh, director of land management, and uh, I, I met Ben several months back as we started the conversation, but certainly I'm just impressed with his breadth and depth of knowledge, and he brings um, a history of municipal experience in his time uh, there with the city of McMinnville as well as a uh, law experience, and then also his corporate management experience from um, uh, Caney Fork Electric Membership Cooperative. And we're glad to have him as part of the team and um, and we've hitched him to the wagon and he's starting to help us pull. And Ben, if you wanted to just say a word, that'd be all right as well. Sure. Council, thank you. Um, Sam, thanks for the kind words. Really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to be here and work with a great group of people. Uh, I've hit the ground running, um, learning tremendous amount. Uh, I've met a lot of council already and uh, very happy to work um, with the uh, Planning Commission as well. So happy to be here and uh, just looking forward to doing a great job. Awesome. We're glad you're on board. And we'd like to congratulate our councilwoman, uh, Jamie. She's getting ready to get married in three days. Yes. Congratulations. Good for you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Our attitude will be a lot different when she comes back. <laughs> Pray for Alan. <laughs> All right. Any other business from staff or council? Sam, one question. I appreciate you following up on the question. I think I posted you about permits and athletic fields. I really do appreciate that, that quick follow up. Todd's Lake and Rutherford, I know we talked about that last year. Have we looked into what it would be to do something to control that vegetation on the side on, on Rutherford it just continues to really grow and evolve. And I, I think it's a lot of runoff coming from the road. Just silt, that's why you're getting grass. Or is there anything we can do about that? Yeah, so uh, I think our last conversation we had talked about the, um, and, and we're still talking about the aquatic vegetation. That's yeah. your question tonight. Yeah. We'll make sure. Um, we we'd talked about what aquatic spraying would look like in per acre and it was um, several thousand dollars per application, several applications per year that were needed to, to control that. Uh, and it seemed uh, cost prohibitive at the time as well as also having a, a question about do we do it in every open water situation that, 
the city may or may not own or there may or may not be a concern about the aquatic vegetation. The, the, the big, the, one of the biggest issues for us, and, and I'm going to nerd out on you a little bit, uh, Councilman, uh, the, the sediment that flows in to Todd's Lake comes from a lot of agricultural areas and it tends to carry a lot of nutrients with it and there's no shade over Todd's Lake because it is a wide open water body and when you put water and nutrients and sunlights together it does exactly what we expect it to do and that's grow green stuff and so the opportunity in there in my opinion would be less about uh, herbicides or contact herbicides or aquatic herbicides to control a, that vegetation but would be more about a resource management plan that looked at maybe removing sediments controlling the nutrients and, and establishing creating some shade in there it's a concept we've talked about the other thing is that's also expensive and so we're we've, we're looking for opportunities with uh, TWRA and some of our other partners to, to see about enhancing that waterway on purpose a few years ago we had the opportunity to acquire some of that property through donation and we thought the city would be able to manage that resource perhaps better than the private property owners and we're still looking for some opportunities to do that okay thank you all right if there's no other business we'll stand adjourned